Well, good morning, everybody. So glad to see you all here with us this morning. Would you guys stay with me and we'll get our morning started uh, Come with a verse coming out of 1 John. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. from 
Please join me in prayer. Father, we just thank you that we can come together this morning and worship you. You are worthy of all of our praises. You are the king over all, the creator of all. Jesus, in you, all things to hold together and have their being. Thank you that you have made yourself known to us, that you died on the cross to save us, that you conquered death, that you're alive and you reign. Thank you that you are alive and seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and that you will come again one day. And you're not just the God in Yakult or America, but you're the God of every people in every nation all over the world. You created it all, and it all belongs to you. We pray that many people would come to know you. We pray for this town and this area that many people who have not known you will come to know you and, and that you would draw many people to yourselves, so that you would use all of us to draw people to yourselves, so that we would have the aroma of Jesus as we live our lives and go to work and in our different spheres, that we would make you known to the people around us. Thank you that you made yourself known to us and that you saved us. We are not worthy, but you loved us and gave your son for us. We thank you and just... Uh, open our eyes to, to see things in your word this morning as we worship you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. It's good to see Mike Shabo here this morning. I, I got a text from Asher. Asher's been working with, with Mike, and uh, I got a text from Asher because he can't call on his phone. It doesn't work to call, so he, he can text. And so I got a text that said, uh, I was I was helping Mike and he, he fell a tree on himself and he's bleeding all over and ambulance is coming, but we can't get a hold of Mary. Can you can you call Mary? <laughs> I'm like, oh no, what happened? And my imagination's running wild and and uh, Mike can give you all the details later. You can you can tell him, but you can see that he's doing all right. And he's here with us, so praise the Lord for his protection and his care. Um, 
And I've learned over the years to take things Asher says with a grain of salt because he can overstate things a little bit. But it was very intense. So, so we're, we're glad that the Lord protected Mike and, and that he's here with us this morning. Uh, a, couple, a couple other announcements. Uh, we're going to pass around, Tandy's going to go ahead and pass around a couple of sign-up sheets for helping out with Leanna Jackson's move. We need, uh, you'll see the different categories of helpers that we need on that sign-up sheet, but next Sunday, directly after second service, she could use um, some strong backs. I was going to say men, which is probably most that will help, but there's some women with strong backs that like to work hard too. So whoever wants to come help move boxes and move furniture uh, from her house here in Yakult to Vancouver, where there will be a truck that needs to be loaded, um, she could use helping hands for that. And that's directly after service next Sunday. Um, She also needs, she's looking for women helpers to come and help her throughout the week to pack up boxes so that it's ready for Sunday. So uh, you can see that's that's a place that's not very well signed up for yet. So if you feel like you have time this week and could arrange a time to co help her, she's just in town here. Um, that she could really, she'd be blessed by that. And if you see her today or this week, just take the opportunity to say goodbye and she'll be heading to uh, Missouri. That's right. <laughs> I blanked for a second. To Missouri uh, after, after all the packing next week. And so uh, we just want to bless her as she moves and um, support her in this. Another short announcement is we're still planning to do Mount Rainier hike one week from tomorrow. Uh, Monday the 25th, so if you are interested and you haven't signed up yet, there's a sign-up sheet on the table out in the foyer. You can put your name and phone number and we'll get back to you with details about it. Um, It's still dependent on weather, if the snow recedes enough to make the hike, but it's a a men's ministry, youth ministry kind of joint activity. So if you're feeling energetic and adventurous, go ahead and sign up for that. And uh, now, I just, now I just want to call the ushers forward to um, move into a time of, of offering. I'll go ahead and, oh, that's second service. No jam, first service. Never mind. Well, let's pray for the offering as we, as we pass this. Father, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for always providing what we need. It doesn't always come in the ways we expect, but you are a good father and you take care of your children. So would you just accept our offering in this form of worship as we give back to you a little bit of what you have given to us. And we thank you and we're so thankful for for all your provision and your care. Um, You are a good father to us and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you're dismissed to fellowship time. Greet your neighbor, say hello, top off your coffee. Um, After we come back in a few minutes, uh, Andy Poole will be uh, sharing with us this morning. If you kindly take your seats, we'll get started.
It's a beautiful day, but it's cool in here. It feels good. Hope you're not too cold. If you're like my wife, you're going to feel cold in a room like this. We want to start with a word of prayer. And it's my privilege to pray for the prayer family. And that's John and Belinda and Belinda's mom, Joan. And they have some health issues in their family. There's some grieving that's still going on from the loss of life. And so as we pray together, we pray for the encouragement and the healing needed in their life. Let's pray together for John, Belinda, and Joan. Father, we thank you that you offer us the opportunity to talk to you anytime, morning, noon, or night. And no matter what our state is, how we feel, whether we're depressed or encouraged or enthusiastic like Asher, we can come to you and you hear us. You know us inside out. We've learned that in reading your word that you knit us in our mother's womb. And you do not put into our lives things that are more than we can bear by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I pray for John and Belinda and Joan that you would meet their emotional, physical, and spiritual needs in their daily life and in their relationships, in the need for health and healing, and also overcoming the sorrow of losing someone you love. We also commit the time we have in the Word this morning. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. I pulled into the parking lot this morning and reached for my Bible, and I said, where are my notes? They were back on my desk. Now, you've never done that, have you, Rob? No. But he just has to go a block. I had to go back to Amboy, and I asked the Lord to forgive me for going over 40 and part of the way. But they're here. (laughs) That was really a sinking feeling. And Jane said, do you want me to go back to get him? And I didn't tell her this, but I'd say, no, you wouldn't go fast enough. You see, she's a real law keeper. (laughs) On the first Sunday on July 3rd, I took time to address two key areas basic to understanding God and his work. First, We took a look at the Bible, God's Word, right here. It is his special revelation to mankind. It's reading and understanding is the foundation to a Christian's life. We are not to take away from it or add to it. So it stands alone as the Word of God. There's no other book like it in history or in the world. It is the Word of God, breathed by God. We looked at the failure of Israel as God's chosen people. God called them a rebellious people. They sinned and cried to God for his forgiveness. In his mercy, he did that. But Israel was soon back to their sinful and rebellious ways. Kind of speaks to the whole of human nature, doesn't it? To the condition of the world. It's rebellious and sinful. God punished both Judah and Israel by sending them into captivity into two neighboring countries, Assyria and Babylon. Several hundred years later, Jesus Christ came into the world, born to Mary and Joseph, but he existed eternally as the Son of God. He always has been. He is the second person of the Trinity. This event was the fulfillment of many prophecies from the Old Testament. However, he was rejected as the Messiah. He was crucified, as we well know. He was buried, but that was not the end. He rose from the dead on the third day. All this was foreordained by God, did not catch him by surprise. It was a part of his plan to pay the penalty for the sins of all of mankind. It is effective for those who confess their sin and by faith receive Jesus as their Savior, Now, you probably know all that, but I find with my teacher background, it's important to review what we know, to remember what we know, to be reminded of the things that God has done. We finished the first Sunday with a look at the establishment of the church. After Jesus went to heaven to be with his Father, he gave his Holy Spirit, who is the third person of the Trinity, as our comforter. And that happened on the day of Pentecost, 50 days 
after the death, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And 3,000 souls were converted on that day of Pentecost because of Peter's message. From that point on, the church spread throughout, throughout the known world. Without radios or televisions or digital means, it spread by word of mouth, which is the best way in many t- cases to spread the gospel. We're part of the universal church, as Bryce mentioned in his prayer. The church exists in every country all over the world. There are millions of people that meet just like we do on this day to honor God. But here at YCC, we're a part of his local church. All over the world, there are millions of churches that meet just like we do. Different cultures, different styles, but they all base it on what? The word of God. That's the foundation. For the church. Last week, we looked at the place that faith plays in coming to God, as stated in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he exists and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We reviewed all the heroes of faith that are mentioned in Hebrews 11. God revealed himself generally to the world by his creation, by what he has done. We see his power, his majesty, so that no one is without excuses. We read that in Romans 1. But also in Romans 1, Paul describes the total rejection of God that the world has given. He said, there's none righteous, quoting from Psalms, no, not one. They're all condemned. And what happened is man began to make a God in his own image. And he also made gods out of birds and reptiles and chunks of stone and silver and gold and all the material things. And millions, if not billions of people worship those kinds of gods today. They're blinded to the truth. That's why general revelation, which you see around you, is not sufficient for salvation. It has to lead you to this creation, special special revelation. <clears throat> we further took a look at God's six days of creation from Genesis chapters one through three, noting that God created by his word all the non-living things and everything else with a clear distinction between humans and everything else he created. Humans are a distinct part of God's creation. We are different from anything else that God created. And we know that they were six literal days because the writer, Moses, says the evening and the morning were the first day. And there's the second day and third day and fourth day and fifth day and sixth day. And then what did God do on the seventh day? He rested. And what did he say about his creation? It was very good. Now, that I I have not gotten into the area of other theories of how things got here on purpose. Because I believe Genesis is so straightforward and so simple that it's not a huge issue if people will believe that God is God and that he is a creator and everything we see was created by him. We concluded last week with the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. God made a beautiful garden. He planted trees and everything that grows, and he told Adam, you take care of the garden. You're the caretaker of the garden. At that time, there was no sin. Nothing wrong had entered into the world as God created. Now, Satan goes way back when he rebelled against God. But in God's creation, there was no sin. But Satan came along, and he tempted Adam and Eve. He tempted Eve by deceiving her. She bit, and she misquoted God's word, and she finally totally disagreed with God's word. And she took the fruit because it was pleasant, nice to see. So she was deceived. Adam went in with his eyes open. He knew that what he was doing was wrong. And he took of the fruit and he ate it. And that changed history, didn't it? Because sin came into the world. Paul in Romans says, whereas by one man, Adam, sin came into the world. And we also read that by the new Adam, who is Jesus Christ, that will be remedied by his death on the cross. It's very plain. 
It's very, very clear. But Satan blinds the eyes and the minds of those who don't know him, don't know Christ. We are told to go into the world and to preach the gospel. And it was within maybe 50 or 60 years after Jesus went to heaven that the gospel spread all across Asia and Europe into all of the parts of the known world, traveling on horseback, on camels or horses or foot, probably most of the time were by ships. They spoke the word of God and people were saved. Today, which is my third Sunday, I have one more. I would like to conclude with an overview of that Old Testament and take us into an understanding of the time we come to when Christ was born. In Genesis, well, in, first of all, in, in my first scripture, which should be on the screen, which we've quoted before, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Now all these things happen to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. They've been coming for 2,000 years because Jesus has not returned yet. But as I've said before, too many people ignore the Old Testament. And I gave the example of my own brother who knows the Lord because they say, I have enough to do in the New Testament. But the new is based on what? It's based on the old. There's almost 900 quotations in the New Testament that come from the old. Genesis alone is quoted 35 times. So you cannot avoid the truth of the Old Testament. And it's written for us as an example. So we'll move forward. Genesis 4 and 5, and this is going to be in a summary format, covers the time from Cain up until Noah, who was 500 years old and had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All of us have a link back to Adam and to Noah. They're in our grandparent file. Humans lived for hundreds of years in that time because the gene pool was pretty clean, pretty clear. You didn't have all the mutations and the things that go wrong as you go from generation to generation. So we know that they lived to seven, eight, nine hundred years. I can't imagine that, but that's the way it was. Of course, they didn't deal with all the stuff that we do today either. And then God, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man's heart was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, that's a pretty strong judgment for God to make. And it was strong enough that he sent a flood that covered the whole earth. It's a universal flood. And everyone died except for eight people. And that was Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their spouses. It took Noah 120 years to build the ark. That's a lot longer than most of us will ever live. It took him 120 years. And the New Testament calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. So for 120 years, while Noah was putting that ark together, probably with his sons, he preached righteousness. But when the time came for the flood, and it had not rained on the earth in the sense that we know rain up until that time, the fountains of the heavens and the earth were broken up. Not one person, not one had repented. That's a staggering thing to run through your mind, that no one repented, even though Noah preached for 120 years. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, going back to the fall of Satan, but cast them down to hell, <coughs> excuse me, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, which is what we're talking about, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. The ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. He's in the Old Testament. It was the place that was safe. It was the place of salvation. So the ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. The rainbow, and we see those in the Northwest every so often, it's a sign from God to us 
that he will never again destroy the earth by water. When you read Revelation, it's another means that's used to destroy the earth. But that was a promise that he gave. Well, we go further, and by the time we get to chapter, as the time that chapter 9 closes, and it hadn't been a long time, we see sin rear its ugly head as Noah's son Ham violated Noah's privacy and he viewed Noah's in his nakedness. And Noah prophesied that Ham, one of his three sons, would be a servant to his two brothers and their offspring. So right away, Satan found a way to pollute the human beings again by having Ham commit sin. Noah lived 950 years. Many scholars put the date of the flood about 2,000 years after creation. How do they do that? Because the genealogies in the Old Testament in the Pentateuch are carefully laid out and they can calculate the number of years between creation and the flood. Then we move on to chapters 10 and 11 and there's a list of genealogies and it's followed by man's attempt to reach God by building the tower of what? Tower of Babel. Man's intent was to do it his own way, not God's way. Oh, we'll just build a tower and we'll get up there, kind of like what Satan did. I want to be like God. Of course, they failed. God did not let it happen. He came down and he confused the languages and he scattered the people. They were all close together at that time. But God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, didn't he? And to spread out. This was not happening. So God took those matters into his own hands and he confused them with different languages and they began to spread all over the world. And the lifespan was reduced significantly after that time because of sin. Chapters 12 through 25 of Genesis recount the life of Abraham. And Abraham has a unique title in Scripture. He's called the Father of the Faithful. That's stated in Romans. There are many amazing incidents in his life. And probably the greatest was when God told him to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. Isaac was the son of promise, born to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. It defied the norms of human life. And when God told Abraham to take his son, his only son, Isaac, he had Ishmael, but Isaac was the son of promise, and take him off into the mountain and to sacrifice him. Now, I'm a father, I have four boys, can't imagine having to face that. And believe me, Abraham had every possible emotion anyone could have when they're told to do that. But remember, Abraham was a man of faith. If you know the story, I hope you do, that he took his son, his son says, where's the, got the wood, the fire, but where's the offering? And what did Abraham say? God will provide an offering. When they got to the mountain, built the altar, tied Isaac on the altar, and Abraham was there with his knife, total obedience, we would say maybe that was lunacy, but he was ready to take the life of his only son. And an angel, the angel of the Lord, spoke to Abraham and stopped him. The angel of the Lord in 22, 11 through 13, called to him from heaven, said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here am I. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his own son. When you read that 22nd chapter, of Genesis. It's, uh, it's an emotional chapter to read all that went on at that time. Now, God knew the obedience of Abraham. The angel of the Lord, when it's referred to with a definite article in the Old Testament, is a pre-incarnation uh, appearance of Jesus Christ. That is the Son of God. Well, he knew what Abraham would do, <clears throat> but Abraham didn't know what he would do. <laughs> and so this was a test of Abraham to see if he was totally obedient to God. And he was. This is also a beautiful Old Testament picture of the crucifixion where Jesus gave his life, the only son of God. He gave his life for you and me. 
The rest of Genesis deals with Isaac and Esau and Jacob and his sons, especially Joseph. It is riveting reading, covers a lot of history, leaves the good and the bad in this history. This is extensive history about Jacob and his going to Egypt due to the famine in his own country. Joseph saves, quote unquote, his family as he becomes second to Pharaoh during the seven years of famine. Now, if you know the story of Joseph, you know that he was a bit um, haughty. He created jealousy among his brothers. And yet Joseph is probably one of the best characters you'll ever read about in the Old Testament. But he was still a fallen human being. He wasn't perfect. And when he saw his brothers who didn't know how to react to finding their brother that they thought was dead, Joseph said, you know, God, you meant it for what? For evil, but God meant it for good. And this is a very important phrase for us to understand that God is the author of history. We think we are, but God is the author of history. Exodus begins with a listing of the 12 sons of Jacob, the children of Israel, greatly increasing in number. With the passing of Joseph and Pharaoh, a whole new era, including slavery for the Israelites, as they were so numerous. I'm not going to reiterate so many things, it's too much, but you know when the Israelites came into the land of Egypt, they were favored because Joseph was second in command. But now it comes to the end, and the Pharaoh was dead, Joseph was dead, the, Egypt, the Israelites were getting so many that they were put into slavery. Many believe they built some of those pyramids and some of those huge cities like Ramesses in Egypt. Moses, Aaron, and the ten plagues take place. Then there's the first Passover. Then the departure from Egypt for God's promised land. And then what would have been an 11-day journey from Egypt to the promised land took how many years? 40 years. How would you like to start a vacation that's going to take 11 days and come back 40 years later? Um, boy, 11 days is a long time for many families. <laughs> but 40 years. And what did they do? They wandered and they wandered. They disobeyed and complained. Everything possible they could do to say, take us back to Egypt was made. God did miracle after miracle. He provided manna. He provided quail. He provided water. He always showed his mercy in spite of their great disobedience. In Leviticus, which for many of us is a tough book to read because it focuses on detailed information about the priests and the offerings and the sacrifices and the commandments that deal with every part of your personal and your public life. He gives the rewards for true worship and the consequences for disobedience. It is a graphic picture of the truth of Romans chapter 3 that, quote, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The need for a Savior is striking as you read through the Old Testament. Numbers recounts the continuing journey through the wilderness. A significant entry is the sending of the 12 spies, one from each of the 12 tribes, into Canaan to spy out the land. You probably all learned this in Sunday school if you grew up in a Christian home. Ten spies gave a bad report, full of fear and doubt and distrust of God and all of his promises. They have to remember that God had told them over and over and over again what he was going to do that he would take them to the promised land. Ten out of twelve said, no, don't believe it. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, gave a good report, and they urged Moses to take the people and go into Canaan in obedience to God. The Israelites were rebellious. They didn't want to go in. They wandered for many, many more years because of the disobedience of what was ten people. God appointed Joshua as Moses' replacement, Moses never got to go into the land of Canaan. He got to see it from the mountain. But because of his anger, which the, the Bible credits to the 
rebelliousness of the people, but it, Moses, Moses was responsible for his anger. He struck the rock twice instead of speaking to it. And God buried him on a place that no one knows. The story goes on for more laws, more progress, more turning back. It included the defeat of some of the cities. They had cities for the Levites, cities of refuge. All the history of Israel is laid out in those books of history. Then we get to Deuteronomy. Now they're sitting there looking at the land of Israel, Canaan, which is beyond the Jordan River. Moses is not dead yet. He recounts much of what he said in the 40 days prior in, before they entered the land. This was a new generation of Israelites and they needed encouragement. What was an 11 day journey stretched into 40 years? Now, what did God do with all those adults who had come out of Egypt? Not one of them entered the land. Because of their grumbling and their complaining and their disobedience, not one of them, not one, entered into the land except for two, Joshua and Caleb. Because they were faithful to God, they had given a good report. They did not join the ten spies. There's the exposition of the law in Deuteronomy, the second reading. He vividly sets before them what living as God's people is supposed to look like. Their relationship with God and with each other and um, with their neighbors. It's all addressed in this book. They're to be a people of love and devotion, demonstrating God's holiness and justice for all to see. That covers Deuteronomy 12 to 26. It's all written out there. The themes are God's, God desires devotion and love. He desires social justice and that reflects our own hearts. He wants the people who are prone to disobedience to turn to him. God's people need instruction, but there is always hope in God. The final three chapters of Deuteronomy is a beautiful, beautiful song of Moses where he sings the praises of God and he blesses the 12 tribes of rebellious people and he passes the baton to Joshua and Moses died at 120 years of age and God buried him in an unknown location. To me, this is pretty exciting history to read the history of the Old Testament. You notice the word history is, can be divided into two words. It's his story. And that's what history is. It's God's story. The Bible is written from God's point of view. Then we go to Joshua. The book opens with God's promise to never leave them and for them to obey the book of the law and not to be dismayed or discouraged. God called the Israelites to live by faith. You know what? They could see the giants in the land. They saw their enemies. They saw the strong cities. They did not see God. They saw the obstacles. They had experienced his works. They had seen his provision, the manna, the quail, the water, but they still fell into doubt and disobedience. Does any of that describe the human condition today? Does it describe our hearts? Do we fall into that when we have all the promises in God's word and sometimes we doubt? We pray and we wonder, will God answer our prayer? When God says you're of more value than anything that I've created, do we really take him at his word? Faith is the key to victory. Joshua had to rely upon God's promise to be with him. So now we enter into the book of Joshua and they start to go into the land. There are battles. There are some battles that are won and there's some that are lost. There's acts of righteousness and there's sinful behavior. By the first chapter, Joshua challenges Israel to follow God. And a famous verse, he says, as for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. Many well-known historic events are recounted in Joshua. You probably have all heard of Rahab and Jericho and the capture of Jericho with musical instruments. You've probably read of Achan's sin when he took something that he wasn't supposed to and buried it under the floor of his tent and it cost him the life of his whole family. You've probably read of the sun standing still 
There were numerous conquests of pagan kings and conquest of their cities and then the division of the land of Canaan among the 12 tribes of Israel. The book closes with the challenge from Joshua, choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he died at the age of 110. He also is a picture of Jesus. And Joshua can be translated Jesus. So he's a great picture. It's hard to find many faults in Joshua. He was a great leader. He was a great man of God. Joshua then moves to Judges. He had died, gone to be with God. Judges opens up with the tribes of Judah and Simeon taking the lead with the first victories over the Canaanite tribes in the cities. There is no one leader throughout the book for God appointed various judges, that's the title of the book, to lead the people. Sadly to say, much of Judges recounts the incomplete obedience of the Israelites to the Lord. The pagan tribes and the peoples they were commanded to completely destroy, they did not. It always came back to haunt them. Some of the saddest biblical events are recorded in Judges. And that's where you find the history of Samson, which is both a victory and a great defeat. When you read books like Judges, we are to learn, like Paul says in Corinthians, from the mistakes that were made. And there were numerous mistakes, and we are not to fall into the same pattern. So Judges closes with a, a very chilling verse, 21:25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Um, that describes some of the days we live in today, isn't it? Where no one wants to bend to authority. No one wants to submit to the governing authorities. And so you have mob rule and unrighteousness and horrible things happen when you don't have righteousness in a country. Then we go to the beautiful story of Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. She was not an Israelite. And Boaz, who was an Israelite, was brought into the genealogy of Jesus. Ruth was a widow. And she was a foreigner in Israel. She chose to go back with her mother. And Boaz redeemed Ruth's deceased husband's inheritance. It's called a kinsman redeemer in the Old Testament. And because Ruth was a part of that family, she was included in the inheritance of that son who had died. And you know the story that Ruth married Boaz and she was brought into the line of Jesus. A, Can a, 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 a pagan was brought into the line of Jesus when she married Boaz. That's amazing. It's the mercy and the grace of God. First and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, they cover the time of Samuel and Saul and David. Samuel is the priest prophet who by the people's demands and God's permission agreed to anoint a king. It was not God's purpose. Who was the king of Israel? It was God. So this was a rejection of God as the king of Israel. They wanted a human king. They wanted someone they could see, not a cloud and a fire that went ahead of them. They wanted to be like all the nations around them. Big mistake. <clears throat> so God in his mercy said, all right, you want it that way? You will have kings. First king was Saul. Saul had Good king or a bad king? Or some of each? Some of each, isn't it? But he also made many attempts to kill David. He was jealous of David. And God spared David's life. And Saul did not have a very good ending in his life. And he was rejected as the king by God. David was a different matter. He was chosen by God to be the king of Israel. And it says in Scripture that David was a man after God's own heart. For a long time, when I would read about the life of David and saw the wonderful things he did, I also saw the fact that David had numerous wives and concubines. He had numerous sons that were always fighting and rebelling. It wasn't a very pretty picture. 
But when I got over my, not over, but when I recognized my own self-righteousness, I realized I was no different than David. A far cry from being David. Because David is a picture of all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And David needed salvation and mercy as much as you and I do. But David was a great king in Israel. And Jesus is in the line of King David. And he says there'll always be a king to sit on David's throne. And that final king will be who? Jesus. He will be the final king that sits on David's throne. Well, if you go through the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, I number my pages because I get confused. King Solomon followed King David. He was Solomon's, he was David's son by Bathsheba. And we won't go into the story of Bathsheba. You probably know about it. But that was another one of David's grievous sins that led to adultery and the killing of Bathsheba's husband. Well, that's where Solomon came from. Again, the sign of God's mercy. When Solomon sat down with God and had a conversation with God, and he did, you can read it, he asked God for the right things. He didn't want wealth and riches and all the rest of it. He asked God for wisdom. He said, help me be a good king to rule my people well. And for a time, he did that. But then Solomon began to have alliances with foreign nations. And he married pagan uh, brides. And he had dear knows how many wives and concubines. He utterly disobeyed what he said he would not do when he first became king. Sadly, Solomon turned away from God and... His death is recorded in 1 Kings 11. He'll be in heaven, I'm sure of that. But who knows what regrets he had when he died. History continues with the division of Israel into Judah and the other tribes under the different kings. The nation was split because of division. Chronicles recounts the lot of Jewish history going back to Adam and the genealogies listed in Genesis and the first five books. We read about the captivity of Judah and the ten tribes to Assyria and Judah going to Babylon. Ezra and Nehemiah, which we covered recently with Pastor Bill, was the, Ezra was a priest and a scribe, and he led the Jews back to Jerusalem. They rebuilt the walls. They ultimately rebuilt the temple, and there's a remnant that returned to the Holy Land. Esther is a beautiful story of a heroine. She was a Jew, and she lived under the Persian king, Ahasuerus. And there was his vizier who wanted to kill all the Jews. And uh, Mordecai, who was the guardian of Esther, whose name was Hadassah, told her to speak to the king because the Jews would be killed. And her final words were, if I perish, I perish. She agreed to speak to the king. And if you know the story of Esther, when... Uh, the horrible man was exposed. He was the one that was hung on his own gallows that he built to hang Mordecai. And the Jews were saved. Getting there. All right, seven. Job is a book. It's one of the oldest books in the Bible. He was a wealthy, God-fearing man had a large family, comfortable life. Anything anyone would want to have, Job had. One day when Satan was in front of God, he told God, he said, you know, the only reason Job serves you is because you're so good to him. He's wealthy, he's healthy, has a big family, blah, 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 blah. And, of course, God didn't believe that. God challenged Job. He said, why don't you go challenge, challenge, say, why don't you go test Job? You can do anything, but you can't take his life. And if you read the history of Job, it's a long book. And a lot of it is hard to understand because he has these three so-called friends who keep telling him what he did wrong. And it would only be right if he corrected what was wrong. Then a younger man came and said, you know, I didn't want to say anything because I'm younger. I wanted to show respect. But he didn't have good advice either. And if you haven't read the last three chapters of Job, you're missing out. Because God spoke to Job and he reviewed what God did 
And Job's final words was, I repent in sackcloth and ashes. And he turned back to God and God restored to him all that he had plus. So Job passed the test of his faithfulness to God. Psalms is a collection of 150 Hebrew hymns. It's known as the songbook of Israel. I read it every day. I love it. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes are the books of wisdom written by Solomon. They cover many practical topics. They're so practical that obedience to God through these writings can spare a person a lot of grief if you just do what it says. The Song of Solomon is a love song, and it's between a bride and a groom. To the Jews, it was a picture of God and Israel, and to us, it's a picture of Christ and the church. Isaiah to Malachi, the last 13 books of the Old Testament, are considered the major and the minor prophets. Major because they're longer. That would be Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The rest are minor because of their size. Some of the prophets served one king, some served many kings. They all warned about disobeying God and the consequences of that. When you come to the book of Daniel, Daniel is extremely uh, appropriate for today because of the prophecies of Daniel. If you read Daniel and Revelation together, there's a lot of allegory, but it also tells you what's coming down the pike in the last days, and we tend to believe we're in the last days. From the close of the Old Testament in Malachi to the time of Christ is a period of 400 years. It's called the silent years. And then right on time, John the Baptist appears, born of Elizabeth. A few months after that, Jesus appears, the cousin of John. And that takes us to the cusp of the New Testament. I may have been foolish to try and deal with the Old Testament in this one message, but my purpose is very simple. My takeaway is just one thing, and I didn't write it on the screen. Do not ignore the Old Testament. Read it every day, even the parts like the genealogies and the sacrifices and the offering. If it wasn't important, why would God put it there? You see, it is important. Ask God to show you what you can learn. I read it daily. 1 Corinthians 10, these things are written for our admonition. What I'd like to do in my last opportunity next week is to go to the New Testament. And I'd, I'd like to take a look at, as God looks down on us today in the, in the latter days of what we think are the latter days of history, although my mother, when I was a little boy, she said, would pray, Lord, hasten your return. And that was over 70 years ago, and it's still 70 years. So no one knows the day or the hour, but we are told to be aware of the times and the seasons, to not be blind to what God is doing. And I would like to look at what does God expect from you and me as Christians living in a fallen world today? And we'll take some of the passages from the New Testament, and we'll do that together. Would you stand with me and pray? Father, I thank you that the power is in the word of God. And you gave us that for a reason. And we are so grateful that the word of God has been preserved all these years, thousands of years, to where we can read it every day. And I trust everyone here will, that it becomes a priority that talking to you becomes a priority, that looking at our daily life would become a priority, that we be a people that brings praise to your name, that honors you in our daily life. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.
hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe display Then sings my soul, my soul So just a reminder, as we close out our service, our prayer team is up front. Um, come, come pray with, uh, uh, with Andy and Tandy. And um, yeah, other than that, have a great week. We'll see you guys. I believe we have a Sunday school in between services in the chapel as well. So we'd love to see you guys there. Other than that, have a great week. We'll see you guys again next Sunday.